My brother Ralphie has broken yet another fan heater. He doesn't quite grasp the concept of not blocking airflow through cheap plastic heaters. And quite often he'll put a blanket over himself while he's waiting for his wood-fired stove to, to heat up and he'll stuck a heater underneath for a bit of heat and then wonders why they die. Let's explore it. Now, uh, I'll power it up first. I have taken all the screws out of this, but I shall power it up and turn it on and the fan runs, I'll point it away from the microphone, but there is no heat. Okay, that's not uncommon. Now there are two thermal protection devices. Oh, I'll just open it up, that's the best bit. I've taken all the screws out because it was doing its best to stop us getting in to explore this. There were two anti-tamper screws here and there was one super deep screw here, but they are out. Well, I hope they're out. They might not be out completely. And uh, we shall open it up. Now, things worth a mention. The heater assembly is mounted to the back. The thermostats are mounted to the front. So when you open this up, take careful note of the route of all the cables through this. And also make sure, kind of important, that it is unplugged. So what do we have here? We have a thermal switch here. Right, tell you what. I'm just going to go and grab my meter. I should have had my meter through here, but I don't. One moment, please. I have my meter, which is set to continuity. Let's, uh, yep, continuity is active. So first thermal cutout. Let's try this one at the side here that is actually against the plastic casing. No continuity. Hold on. It might just be making a bad connection. No, I think it is this one that's actually failed. Right, tell you what, I'm just going to pop this off and take a closer look at it. One moment, please. I have procured the driver. This isn't my normal bench, so I don't really have all my tools here. So this one fits. Here is the first thermal cutout. It's unusual to find one this side. It's usually just the ones down here. There's one down here with a thermal fuse. I always think it was the thermal fuse that was away. But it appears to be this one. So that is making connection to there. But there's no continuity through the contact. So that's a burnt or dirty contact. And this thing's a bit corroded, to be honest. I wonder if it's just suffered corrosion damage. Now, what about this other one here? There's a second thermal cutout down here that I can probe by going on to here and here. It is also seemingly not making a good connection. Is everything just corroded in this? It is. That's dire. And what about the thermal fuse? Last resort, thermal fuse. The thermal fuse is fine. Right, I'm going to try and clean these, but here's a thing. Aside from the fact that he's probably had this out in a garage or something, it's kind of corroded. Uh, if these cycle too often, if you do cover the heater and it cuts in and out, uh, the contacts tend to fail very quickly because they're not rated for many cycles. And when they fail, the last resort, if they weld together, the last resort is for the thermal fuse to go. But I'm going to try and clean these by getting a bit of cardboard and I'm going to slide between them and, well, I'll just use this bit of paper here, in fact. This would work, assuming they're going to actually go together. Here's a bit of paper, which is slightly abrasive, and I shall drag it. And when you drag it between contacts, it's a common old trick to repair contacts, you can see the dirt that's coming off that. But the question is, is it actually, whoop, rip, is it actually going to close together enough force to actually make connection? It does have the advantage that uh, there's a fairly high voltage. Well, 240 volts open circuit across these, which will help make a connection. Let's try that. Has that helped? No. I wonder if these contacts have been... It's just barely making a connection there. I think with the mains behind it, it would actually just jump that gap, so to speak, the break down the last res residue of the oxide. I'll tell you what, I'm going to clean that contact as well down there. And uh, we'll put it back to, we'll put the cover back on, just for safety. And uh, we'll give it another go. So I'm going to, I'm trying, 
not doing very well. I shall rip off a strip. Common enough technique. This is where I have to be very careful not to pull this contact too far, because they really are flimsy little contacts, and they're dealing with these heaters. They're dealing with 8 amps, which is quite a lot. There is oxidation on them. Maybe I've just accused Ralph of knacking this heater, and really, it's just crappy contacts. I mean, it's a cheap heater. Right, tell you what, I'm going to pop this back up. Actually, I'll screw that back on, will I? I'll screw that back on. That would make a lot of sense. This is where it's worth reminding you. When you do repairs like this, uh, do make sure that when you're turning things on and off, that you leave it off before you stick your fingers in again. Right, tell you what, let's uh, turn this on. Plug it in, uh, tilt it back. And it's heating up with a slight smell of smokiness. So it was tarnished contacts or damaged contacts by pitting, which isn't that uncommon, making sure that I unplug it. One of the biggest pitfalls of do-it-yourself appliance repairs is people who turn things on and turn them off and turn them on, turn them off, and then they completely forget they left it plugged in and turned on, or they unplug the wrong thing. So in this instance, it is recoverable. Now all I have to do is screw this back together again. I might leave out the, the anti-tamper screws, the safety screws, because they're just a pin ass. Uh, but uh, Ralph can have this back now, with a warning to not store it out in damp garages and also to make sure he doesn't cover them. But uh, that is actually a win. That is a, a good repair. And now I have to say that... Uh, it's kind of important when you put it back together. Just make sure all the wiring is dressed into the correct place. It's worth taking photos when you do stuff like this to make sure the wiring is rooted around in the correct location. I've just moved that over to that side of that because it, there's a very good chance uh, you really want it kept well away from blades and things like that. But there we go. Uh, that's a surprising end to that video. I thought I was going to be writing this heater off as destroyed by overheating to the point that the thermal fuse had blown it. The answer to that one is to replace the thermal fuse, but sometimes they're not very accessible because of the way they're manufactured. They're manufactured cheaply, and uh, sometimes it's just quite hard to replace the thermal fuses and get access because of the sequence that are manufactured in. It's also worth mentioning, if you replace the thermal fuse, you have to take care, if you're soldering it, that you use a heat shunt to take it away from the uh, from the wires as you're soldering it and leave them as long as possible and fold them carefully out the way. Because otherwise you can trip the new thermal fuse with your soldering iron while you're trying to repair it. <laughs>